Blessed be God, God Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Spirit. Almighty God, to you all, all hearts are open, all desires known, and, and from, from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through, through Christ our brother. Amen. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, Holy Immortal One, have mercy upon us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy Immortal One, have mercy upon us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy Immortal One, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of compassion, you welcome the wayward and you embrace us all with mercy. By our baptism, clothe us with garments of your grace and feed us at the table of your love through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and brother, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal. To this day, while the Israelites were encamped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on that day, they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Let us read the psalm together. Happy are those whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt, and in those spirits there is no guile. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you gave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faith will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. And do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding, who must be fitted with bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. A reading from 1 Corinthians. From now on, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. 
That is, in Christ God was reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in time we might become the righteousness of God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to be one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him, but he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you, 
and I've never disobeyed your command, and yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Creator, Christ, and compassionate Spirit. Amen. Amen. First, I want to say how great it feels, energetically and otherwise, to have young people in our midst, and I thank you. It is such a joy that was so fantastic, just walking in the freshness of your spirit and presence. Thank you. So I've got a question for you, and not only young people here, but all of us, children of any age. How many of you, when you listen to this parable, really empathize with the older brother? Like the guy, the, the sibling that's always doing, the responsible one, right? Who's, who always shows up, is loyal, okay. How many of you are that sibling? How many of you are like, yeah, that's me? Yep, my other siblings, they kind of like slackers, you know. All right. How many of you have ever been that sibling who's like, mm, I'm going to do a little sassing with mom and dad, maybe kind of break some of the rules? Did any of you ever do any of that? Oh, I, like, li people a little more shy, except for young people are actually honest here. <laughs> so... Um, my aunt Cynthia, so back in the 60s while my stepdad was in Vietnam, my aunt Cynthia, with her Republican conservative parents, she went off to join a free love commune, okay? But, but guess who was the loyal sibling when their mom got dementia and had Alzheimer's? Who do you think was the sibling who was by her side, right? that Aunt Cynthia, okay, the wild child, all grown up. And then after my grandma Winnie, my step-grandmother passed away, uh, my Aunt Cynthia in her 50s went to nursing school. She went to college. She went back to college in her 50s to focus on geriatric care and part out of love for her mother. And I share that partly, like, don't give up on anyone in the size of love. And we can't join or judge our siblings too much Sometimes we can braid ourselves for not being perfect children or perfect siblings either, or judge ourselves for being uh, frustrated, uh, resentful, jealous siblings. We kind of do this thing with each other. Or sometimes we do it to ourselves that we don't think we're good enough. My brother and I, when we were little, we would be like the bionic man and bionic woman, and we'd start by doing playful pretend punching, you know, like, little, and kung fu karate chops until someone accidentally or on purpose hit the other one in a way that was not playful, and then it just started wailing on each other. Does this sound familiar? No? Yes? Okay. I got a broken collarbone at age three that way, okay? I was like this, and my mom didn't know for a while, and then she finally took me to the doctor. Um, but it's equal. Guess whose name I carved on the front door to our house? and didn't come forward to, I confess this now, and I've confessed it to my parents, but my brother got in so much trouble for that, okay? I, gosh, I was a really sneaky kid. 
little sister, you know, doing what I had to do um, to, for payback. Um, <laughs> so, um, who knows? You know, I'm re redeemed. You know, I can become a priest still, I guess. Uh, so, Lent, I started off on Ash Wednesday saying how Lent is this season where we imitate, follow, go with Jesus into the wilderness right? Remember that story in the wilderness where he's got all these temptations and the temptations for being all powerful, but also the temptation of self-sufficiency, right? I don't need, like, I got it. And then realizing, no, I mean, even Jesus is out there in the wilderness with the temptation, like, I need God's grace and strength to help me. I can't do this on my own. But it's not just going by ourselves. We often think Lent is about my own personal um, spiritual growth and development, but the season, we do this in community with others, all right? So the mental habits, I've talked a lot about the desert abas and amas, working with the kinds of thoughts that are mental habits that we have, and that's what these desert fourth century folks were teaching, like the temptations for jealousy, sloth, apathy, you know, the, the whole gamut of what was eventually called the seven deadly sins, but long before they were sins, they were just called um, thoughts, the thoughts that hook us, okay? Acknowledging that they're very human. So what does it mean to be in community? And family, I think, is a great petri dish for helping us, you know, get to know what are our mental habits and how do we act out or how do we suppress what we really think, whatever, with our families growing up, with our siblings, if you had siblings with your parents, so that when you are in society more, you, you've already had this kind of precursor preparation. So um, it could be your ego, mind, fears, and frustrations, your mental habits, um, it, but also areas of personal growth um, that community um, needs. And we practice with that. We practice the ability to forgive with our family, with our siblings, right? We practice the ability of having acceptance. I don't know how many of you as kids, like your BFF, your best friend, you know, you could just get really mad at each other playing Barbies or something. And then, like, the next day it's like a do-over. It's like, you know, you just, okay, you kind of move on. Um, the whole issue of fairness and justice, siblings, like in our parable today, are really good at that. You know, everyone should have equal, right? No one gets to be the favorite. Um, but also um, learning, what do we do with resentment and jealousies? And I don't think we're as good at that, like honestly naming that as families, which is why coming to church and hearing parables like what Jesus is teaching us um, is helpful and why faith and community is helpful. There is uh, something called, if you haven't heard about it yet, um, generational trauma. That there are things that happened or have happened to our ancestors, habits and patterns um, that get passed down generationally or something that happened long ago that's still working itself out in a family dynamic several generations later, right? I've heard some people say that might be true of this congregation, going back to when there was a merger, right, in the 1997 or something, that maybe sometimes there's still, I don't know, and maybe I just put my finger on the wound a little too much, but I'll bring it back a little bit. Think about slavery in this country. What are the psychological wounds that are passed down, the physical traumas passed down? What about socioeconomic wounds, racism passed down? Things like after World War II, if you haven't taken the racial justice training that's hosted here, it's such a great training. It's, it's just a few hours of your day, and boom, for a lot of people, it's like, I get it now. Like, soldiers who went off to fight in World War II, and they come home, and then there were a whole bunch of folk, white folk who were soldiers who fought, were given really inexpensive home loans. So they became first-time homeowners, right? But that wasn't extended to our soldiers of color. African-American and other soldiers didn't get that same benefit. And then look what happens over time. Inheritance, 
part of our parable today is about inheritance, right? So over time, we have white folk, predominantly more who are homeowners than black folk, for example, and how over time, how the wealth can, can accumulate and be handed down to the children and the children's children. So that right now, we still have this huge economic disparity that gets passed down, all right, on top of the traumas of racism and slavery that are already there, all right? Some people even talk about energetic trauma, um, horrible things maybe that have happened to a loved one in the past, whether that's physical abuse, incest, or a habit like anger explosion with alcoholism, or fighting in a war, the wounds, um, my brother has said, the, co the quail men all struggle for, with depression in my family. Not all the females, but the men, and he thinks with the work he's done with his therapist, it goes back to the Civil War, looking at the patterns of how loss impacted families without fathers and just that, all that kind of stuff um, since the Civil War. So it's an interesting thing, whether you believe it or not, about the sociological impact, the psychological, but maybe even energetically, and for some people, spiritually, why with prayers for forgiveness, people go back and they ask and they pray for healing for their ancestors. Go back, pray for healing for the ancestors, for the, those who were slaves and those of slave owners. Some of us have that history way in our past but also how that healing could help us in the present by going back and assisting them, accompanying them with their healing. Something to think about, and maybe when we pray the Lord's Prayer together, to think about that, not for eliciting guilt, but really to be free from the history of families, what we do to each other and to other families and individuals and as a society. So um, let me unpack this parable a little bit. So we have the younger son who basically is saying to his dad, I want my inheritance now. Basically, he was saying, I wish you were dead. So can I have my money now? Can I have my money now? You can just die now, and I'm going to take your money, and I'm going to go do all the vile things that I've wanted to do that you don't want me to do. And then, of course, there's this redemption moment, and he comes back, and, and we pray to God that it's sincere. It seems sincere. You know, the fear is the older brother is envisioning the younger brother after the party, kind of leaning back with his heads, you know, I got this, you know. And the older brother, you know, he's already half the inheritance. He would get 50%, probably more back then, sociologically. The older brother usually got more. But with the younger ba brother back on the scene, there's even more of a cut. So is he going to get another, another cut? It's, will he end up getting a quarter more? So, you know, <laughs> so you just imagine with the way siblings think about what's fair, and um, dad, you know, yes, you have the older brother, maybe with some resentment, but dad, he is willing to risk being ostracized socially for receiving his son back. That might sound strange, but, but in terms of stigma at the time of someone who went wild and went away and left the group of who is and who isn't acceptable a touchable or an untouchable, this kind of a thing. He went out to over there, and now he's back. Um, so there were some risks socially, but the real big punchline, right, is the extravagant grace, the extravagant love of God. That's the point of the story, the extravagant love of God, whether you're, you know, the, the younger brother or the older brother side of yourself. Several takeaways, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, extravagant love of God, even for when we mess up. Even when we messed up when we were younger and we still feel horrible about that. The extravagant love of God. Maybe it's time to say, Scott, again, I'm really sorry about when I carved your name in the door and you got, you know, you got a, a licking for that. But other things. Maybe it's finally letting go of the resentment. Maybe God's extravagant love also means um, um, stepping up more. You know, so I'm going to help take the burden off my older brother a bit more. Um, I think the message also is that we need one another. We need life and community. We need faith and community. We do churches. 
we come together and worship instead of just always doing it on our own because we need other people in order to grow, right? In order to learn even the prickly pear people, the people that rub you wrong at work or at school, right? Or in your family or even in your faith community, they kind of help expose, you know, what is it that I'm here that I still have to learn on my soul's journey? Whether or not you believe in karma, if you think about it, what are those patterns you have that your soul is here to learn in this lifetime? You know, what are your buttons? Do you tend to get oh so serious and intense? Do you need to be playful? Um, is forgiveness one of your life lessons? So I need these other people to help me learn and grow, right? So that's a, one of the reasons we do faith in community. We pray the Lord's Prayer daily, right? Asking for forgiveness just as we need to be forgiven um, and forgiving. Let me also say... Um, Again, relying like Jesus did on God's grace. And let me end with this. Eddie Hellimson, anyone know of her? She um, died in the concentration camps of um, the Holocaust. She was a young woman. If you ever want to re have a really good read, her diaries are powerful. You know of Anne Frank, but if you ever want to do a book report, Eddie Hellimson, we have her spiritual jour journals. For her, the idea of the divine who's within, and, and I, the, I started teaching you some interior prayer practices about God being oh so close, even breathing within us, God's presence, the friend, the beloved within us. She took that so seriously. We have in her writings, her writing in the camp saying, I, we need to protect and defend God that's in here. So if you're that person, whether it's on the playground or in society, if you're a member of a group that's shunned or oppressed, or if you know of another group that's treated as less or doesn't have equal rights, the need to honor and defend. Imagine what this also does for people, this spiritual practice of sensing God's not just out there, but even in here, for people with low self-esteem, people in battered women's shelters. I'm going to protect and defend God, right here, okay? This is at the heart, I'll just end with this, of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's theology. That we're all made in the image and likeness of God. And that drove everything. That drove his principles of love, including for the oppressor, and not responding with retaliation and hate, not coming down to the level of hate. Gosh, the courage it takes, right? When someone spits on you, belittles you, hurts your children. We're wired to respond, right, with malice and anger. There's healthy forms of anger, and then there's that line. Reverend King studied what Gandhi was doing in India for equal rights, right? breaking the caste system. Gandhi studied Jesus. All these texts, Jesus is talking when he tells this parable to the people who are in the power and who feel good, like we believe we're in good God, with God. He's saying it to the sinners, the tax collectors, those not deemed so as acceptable. So the whole idea of God's inclusive love in everyone, and I would say in all beings. So perhaps, just throwing this out, maybe it's a little too wild to suggest this, with my daughter in global climate change study graduate program, what if at some point we also need to get over our anthropocent, I'm not saying it right, anthropocentism, trism, I might, can't speak this morning. We are so human oriented there was a piece of the Antarctic today the size of Texas, or sorry, this past week, that collapsed into the ocean. What might we do to, ins to ensure the inheritance or future of the planet, not just for human beings, but for animals and for the earth and for the water and the sky? How might we be the love that's inclusive, the God of ours that created it all and is in all. May it be so. Amen.
Good morning. I am Celia Powell, and I'm a part of the youth event that happened both yesterday and today for the beloved community. And I am going to be leading the Nicene Creed, and please say it with me in unison. So let us confess our faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begot not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. From the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Our loving parent, you provide every need for your people who remain in your care. In your love, you show us what it means to seek the lost and bring them home. We praise, we praise your name. For the earth and its beauty. We praise your name. For the wisdom and commitment of the leaders. We praise your name. For those celebrating birthdays. John, Tim, and Corey. We praise your name. You are the source of solace in every need. We lift before you Karen, Lotus, Joseph, Jeremy, Larry, John, Richard, Steve, Teresa, Maureen, Cass, Joanne, Rich, Kevin, Carolyn, Peter, Crystal, Sean, Vic, Sally, Marion, David, Carol, Corinne, Nancy, Cloyd, Haley, Joe, Patty, Mark, Mary, Fritz, Jan, Don, Daryl, Doug, Diane, and Susie and Chris, and for those, all those in continuing prayer. For those who have died and those who mourn. For peace between all nations of the earth. Give your grace to all we name before you. Lord. O gracious God, accept the fervent prayers of your people and the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive, forgive you all your sins, sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ. Strengthen, strengthen you in all goodness, 
and by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Good morning. Kate with Outreach, I use she, her pronouns. I am so excited to announce Kenwood Park Social Club here in our Undercroft. <laughs> for seniors and friends, uh, CEC members, and neighborhood uh, community members beginning Tuesday, April 12th, and then ongoing on Tuesdays from 2 to 4 p.m. We are looking for CEC members to attend, and also um, some of you might be interested or willing to be greeters to assist uh, Cindy Meese Peterson, who is going to be our staff person for uh, the social club. So please see me if you're interested in being a greeter and if you have any other questions. Thank you. Hello, I'm Parker Meineke, uh, Senior Warden. I have some updates about um, our COVID restrictions and our service. Um, so after updated guidelines from the diocese and the CDC, the vestry met and we discussed um, these restrictions and such. Um, and it's important to note that these restrictions are subject to the supply clergy that's officiating at the time. Um, so beginning next, uh, Sunday, April 3rd at 9 a.m. Um, we will be recommending masks, but uh, they will not, no longer be required. Um, even so, in this uh, optional mask service, we're going to have a small section of required masks near the lectern, um, but the rest of the, of the pews are masks uh, optional. Um, we will have a second service beginning at 11.15 that is masks required, uh, and all the restrictions will be in place there. Um, and we are going to, regarding communion, we will be resuming our standard order of service um, where we come to, this is not this service, by the way, this is next service. Um, we come to the altar for communion, then we'll return to our seats, uh, have prayer, blessing, and dismissal. Um, and then we will be doing uh, intinction by the priest with wine, if so, if desired. Um, we will also be exiting to the narthex, once again, the Book of Common Prayer and hymnals will be returned to the pews. Uh, coffee hour will be resumed outside uh, when possible and indoors when, not, when weather is not permitting. Um, the vestry will revisit these restrictions and order of service at our next April 15th meeting. Um, restrictions may be further relaxed if spread in hospitalizations uh, continue to decline. And of course, our current existing guidelines uh, would require us to reinstate certain restrictions if the county does return to medium or high spread. Um, does anyone have any questions about this? Yes. The bishop's guidelines allow the shared cup. Yes, so the um, vestry has decided to leave that up to the officiating clergy and they have opted to at least for the next a uh, few services we will be doing in Tingshin um, per the officiating clergy's desires. So just, that's a nice middle way between nothing and drinking from the common cup co 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 had in Tingshin, right? right? Where you place the host into the wine. The wine. However, However, remember, remember you still receive, receive one element. One element. You, just you just want to receive the host. And just also a reminder that second service that Parker made reference to, what did you say, 1115? 
that is going to be morning prayer, so that's not a Eucharistic service. Th yeah, thank you for clarifying. Okay, that. so if you're wanting the full shebang, still come at 9, <laughs> yeah. and it's going to be safe here, here for people in mass, mass, and then mass, and mass optional elsewhere. Okay, so just know what you're getting if you come at 11.15. It's just morning prayer, simple, simple. Okay, and there's no sermon, there's no Eucharist. I can be a, um, a layperson-led service at 11.15. I, thank you for clarifying that. I, I should have mentioned that. Um, sometimes, if, a, if an officiating clergy is willing, we may be able to have a full service then, but for the time being, it will be, as, as Captain mentioned. Um, any other questions? Okay, so, separate topic. The annual meeting will be after this service. Um, we can give you all five-ish minutes um, before we begin our, um, our annual meeting. So, thank you. Just a short announcement. As many of you know that Christopher Anson passed away in February. He had been a member of this congregation. Uh, we remember him, especially for his beautiful voice, singing, and... Um, also uh, reading um, and, and just for the, the beautiful person he was um, he died of COVID uh, in February and his wife Lisa is just devastated um, I have been given an envelope with uh, her address um, if you would like to send a card to her um, there are little slips of paper in here with her address and um, this was given to me by Tom, who feels that we shouldn't disseminate um, the information widely because of, of some of the things that happen when it, that's done. So um, I will put this over here on a chair. Um, are we leaving in the back this time? So, so for, for today, today will be, will be the last day, day unless, unless there's, there's another surge, surge in the pandemic, pandemic where, we, where will we will for the last time be receiving host and going out this way. So yeah, I think a chair back there would be a good place. Thank you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave, and gave himself, himself as an offering and a sacrifice unto God. May we do likewise. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God.
God of grace, you lift our hearts because though we squandered your abundant gifts, you waited for us to turn back to you. And though we harden our hearts to your mercy, you came to find us and draw us home to your banquet. In Christ, you made the journey into the far country of our exile from you. And in his death and resurrection, you justify and sanctify us to stand in your presence and to be reunited with your grace. We give you thanks, gathering around the table of your kingdom with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven singing your endless praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. God of blessing, you are the host of our joy. In Christ, you have made every preparation for this feast, even giving your own body that we might never be hungry again. Send your Holy Spirit so that we may once again belong in your house as your sons and daughters, and so that these signs of sustaining bread and renewing wine may be for us the body and the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, who at supper with his disciples took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gathering God, when we languish with the world in a humiliation of our own making, may this broken body heal, restore, and renew our bodies. When we lurk in the shadows, in a resentment of our own devising. May this shed blood soften and cleanse and refresh our hearts. Strengthen our hands that we may seek a world where there is no hunger except hunger for you. Empower our spirits that we may strive for a world where there is no thirst except thirst for your righteousness. Hasten the day when this body shows us your desire for our well-being, and this blood reveals how far you go to save us from ourselves and restore us in the image of your Son, through whom and with whom and in whom all honor and glory are yours now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ taught us, we are bold to say, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts with faith and thanksgiving. May God bless you and keep you. May God's countenance shine upon you, in you, and through you, and on to those you love, and to those you may struggle to love. And may the blessings of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Comforter be with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.